I have one main promise that I'm making. By the end of this, you'll learn how to build a playbook that systematizes your sales process so you can ramp your reps faster, have more consistent performance out of those reps, and scale predictably. The sales playbook is what can get you there. And how do I know that? Well, let me give you three bullets on my background. I've worked with over 70 B2B software and service companies, specifically working with them to build a repeatable sales process. I've written three Amazon best-selling books. One is on cold outreach, that's called Cold the Committed. The other is on how to run sales development teams, that's called the Sales Development Framework. And then the third and most recent one is called 16 Steps to Repeatable Sales. That's a step-by-step process for building a repeatable sales process. And then finally, I've helped our clients sell over 100 million in software and services, about 280 million in money raised across the customers I've worked with that are venture backed, which is about 20 to 30% of the companies I've worked with. And I've trained over a thousand salespeople. So I've been around the block, both at an executive level. I've been in board meetings when sales are great. I've been in board meetings when sales are definitely not great. And I've also been a salesperson trying to close deals and I've been in SDR cold calling. So I've seen the front lines doing the work, uh, understanding and executing on a workflow. And I've been behind the scenes looking at the operations and also thinking more at a strategic level. There's one main problem that I see time and time again, whenever I work with founders, most sales orgs allow the reps that they hire to determine if they are successful instead of the process that they developed. So what I mean by this is you hire and you hope. And if it doesn't work out, you say, hey, that rep wasn't all that good. Or if you're a compassionate leader, you might ask yourself, did I not give them the resources they need to be successful? Are our scripts not good? Is our product not well positioned here? Is our messaging weak? Are our leads bad or is the salesperson bad? We don't know because we don't have a process. And too many organizations, especially early on, try, try to hire themselves into a process. It goes the other way. You build the process, you hire to execute against the process. And how you systematize the sales process is by building a sales playbook. I wanna walk you through an example of a sales playbook. This is a template I'm happy to give you. Um, the sales playbook example here is going to walk through all of the things that should be in a sales playbook. And I expect you, if you don't have a sales playbook already, to use this to build your own. So here's what it looks like. We start with calling it what it is, a sales playbook. Uh, you're going to have a section here where you put in your company name, it's a sales playbook, and then a one-line message about how the team can use this playbook. I expect sales playbooks to be used beyond just the initial onboarding of the sales reps by making sure that we have the materials that they need in the playbook. And as we update the process, update the messaging, that updates in the sales playbook as well. So the, the reps keep coming back to it. So here's a quick overview of the sales playbook. It's split into two main sections. The first section is the about us. That's where we talk about who we are, what we do, who we help, and why we win. The next section is your roadmap to success. By the way, this is a big part of the sales playbook and often missing when I review sales playbooks. You need to outline what's our sales process, what's our buy again strategy, getting customers to upsell, cross sell, what are the tools, what tools do we have to actually support the reps, and what is our performance culture, the numbers we're holding the team accountable to. All of this also needs to be built into that sales playbook. So first section about us, and we're going to start with who we are. Here's what I recommend. You need to list your company's values in the beginning. Value, description of value. If you don't have company values, you need to make those. But you need to have whatever the value is, a description of the value. Then the org chart. I recommend keeping the org chart up to date, obviously, but I recommend putting it in the sales playbook so all the reps know who they need to reach out to if they need to get certain things done. I also like to include a welcome note from the CEO here. Um, here's a blank one from Bob Smith, but uh, put, put a nice thoughtful note from the CEO. Now, what do we do? This is where we're getting into what the company actually does. We start with the company mission. And if you don't have a strong company mission, I put in here the a very simple framework for building one, but you should sit down and really be thoughtful and create a company mission. So we're on a mission to help target market achieve goal without risk or neg negative thing. We do that by process or solution and commitment to whatever the value is. 
that's a common framework I see. Make sure that's in the sales playbook. Next, we have products. So if you have multiple product lines um, or if you have add-ons to a base product, you want to put in all the products that you sell and a description of those products and then a breakdown of the pricing as well. So this is giving the reps a good understanding of what are our different product lines, how much do things cost, so that way they have a kind of a baseline of what to expect there. A lot of sales playbook don't include this stuff. And they expect to learn pricing through like separate pricing sheets, um, going to meetings and talking through different pricing. We want this in the sales playbook too. We want one centralized place for all of these things to live. It's okay if you link out to it because you have complicated pricing, but it needs to be in the sales playbook. Next, we're going to go to who we help. This is big. I want you to include your ideal customer profiles or what we call market map in the sales playbook. I'm going to give you in this template our worksheet for building out ideal ca uh, client profiles and doing market mapping. And what that means is we're looking at the total uh, addressable market and we are breaking it down into different verticals and then buyer personas. It's a very detailed um, exercise that we take people through. It's going to be in this template when I give it to you. So use it. You really want to make sure that every rep that you bring on has a clear understanding of the people they're selling to and then the different verticals in the markets that they that you guys sell into. Next, who we help. And this is where your case studies, testimonials, and examples go. Real quick here, if you do not have case studies, I don't care how early your, you are in your product development, case studies and testimonials are mandatory. Sales reps really need that to one, feel more confident about the products that they're selling. That's important. But also to help make, uh, help enable the buyers to make a buying decision. They need to have confidence that your solution is going to work. Case studies do that. You can never have too many. And that should be a huge priority for you. Get as many case studies as possible. Now we're going to go into why we win. And this is really going to be about differentiators and what we call the value map. The value map is an exercise that we do. I'll give you the template to it where you identify your value drivers of your product to your buyer, right? From their perspective, what are the value drivers that make this product worth having? And then what are our differentiators as well? This needs to be crystal clear and real. There's way too many times that I work with an organization that has these differentiators and then it turns out the competitor does the exact same thing. Okay. They need to be real. Okay, call me crazy. Um, so spend some time, really get clear about your uh, value drivers here. So for example, if you are a CRM solution, one of your value drivers isn't we store leads to, uh, you know, store leads so you can follow up with your prospects. No, it's the result of having that. White labeled customer support. Is that exciting to anybody? What's the real value they're, they're getting? from having the white label customer support or white label, uh, white glove customer support, right? That's how I want you to think. I want you to go deep and really understand your different value drivers. And you should interview your customers and ask them, what do you find the most valuable out of our solution? And what part of our solution were you not expecting to be as valuable as it ended up being? Really important to understand that stuff. And you put it in the sales playbook. We want the salespeople speaking this language. The next thing here is your roadmap to success. This is giving the reps the keys of the castle. Stuff I just showed you, you probably all heard of that. That's table stakes. You need that in a sales playbook. Maybe in more detail than other sales playbooks have it, but they're, they're going to have that. Here's where you tell the sales rep, this is what you have to do to be successful. And that's the level of confidence I want you to have when you're bringing on salespeople. Do this. Remember when I was talking about hire and hope? So many, so many companies hire the sales rep and say, what do you think? What do you want to do? And then they wonder why they are not consistent or they're just not good. They don't do a great job. You hire a sales rep. They say, oh, I used to do it this way at my previous company. They're doing it their old way and it's not working for you. I've worked with five different cybersecurity companies. Three of them were software companies. Two of them were service companies. They sold in the very similar, if not the same markets. The selling in the services side, very similar services in the software side, a little more diverse, but you know, in the same world, completely different strategies for all of them. I thought it was going to be like copy and paste, especially for the service companies. You're like, okay, this is just the same playbook. It's not. And what works for one company doesn't work for the other. And we can debate why that's true till we're blue in the face. I think by the way, it's mostly leadership and culture, but we can debate that. Um, 
The key here is that we are giving them the roadmap. Reps, we want you to do this. You're hiring your first sales rep. There's no question marks. This is what we're doing. And based on what the data tells us, we'll make changes. So even if you're hiring your first rep, I want you to have that amount of clarity when you bring on a sales rep. Okay, so what's the roadmap to, this, to success? It starts with our sales process. So outline, whether it's inbound, outbound, if it's both, outline what the prospect journey looks like. Now, you can go as crazy as you want with this and build beautiful flow charts, but at the bare minimum, I want you to include step one, they do this action, step two, they do that action, boop, 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 until they actually sign a deal. What's their journey look like as they're going through the process of making a buying decision? You outline that from an inbound and an outbound perspective, depending on how you're uh, structured. Next, what the sales process is for lead statuses. So I recommend you having a workflow or a flow chart of a lead and the different statuses those leads go to. Now, if you're not too familiar with a lead statuses, then what I would say is you need to dive deep into them. If you're doing a lot of outbound, even inbound lead management, you have reps reaching out to leads constantly. It's a way of organizing leads. I have a CRM setup guide. I'm going to link here. Um, it's a way to organize leads so you know what happened. Open leads, brand new, working leads, they're actively being reached out to and we haven't made contact. Prospect is we made contact, but we didn't book a meeting. Disqualify, they didn't qualify. Bad data, bad data. Nurture, we've tried to get in touch with them. They never answer their phone or whatever it might be. They never reply to an email. Now they're in a nurture. And then open deal, we booked a meeting with them. We have an open deal. So you want to make sure that that's very clear and what that looks like from an admin perspective is here in the sales playbook. Next here, our sales process, sales stages, okay? What are the stages of our sales process, those deal stages? A couple of things I'm going to give you here in this section, qualification methodology, discovery guide, so how you manage the discovery. If you have a full script for your discovery, put that in there. If you have a guide that guides them through discovery, you put that in there. Demo guide or script goes here too, and then the CRM setup guide so they understand how the CRM gets set up. I've included templates here for all of this. So use those if you want them and totally free. But if um, you have your own, put them in here. So it's very clear. This is what we do from a sales perspective, both the high level stages of the sale all the way to here, the scripts you're using at each stage. Next, we're going to talk about outbound messaging. So if you're doing outbound, you want to include your sequence, your cold call scripts, your emails. One of the things I'm going to say here is that if you're just starting your outbound program, pick one channel. Don't build a whole sequence. In here, I have a template for you to build out your sequence. But if you don't have multiple channels working, pick one, pick cold calling, start using that, get some traction with that, and then expand into other channels. If you don't have one channel working, it doesn't make sense to start trying to weave in a whole bunch of channels. You need to track these things. You need to optimize them to build them. So there's um, kind of everything under sales process, sales messaging goes there. If your inbound messaging goes here too, any emails you want them sending out, those templates, put all of that here. Okay, what does the account management or customer success stages and process look like? Here's an example. Put your own flow chart of what, what the handoff looks like from sales to onboarding, what health checks are happening, what does renewal look like? There's auto renewal. Are we reaching out beforehand to make sure that the auto renewal goes smoothly? Is it a manual renewal? So we have to meet with them. What's it look like? So that way the sales rep has full context of what's happening after they've made a sale. Then we're going to go through tools to support you. Now, if you've been following me long enough, you know, I like a very simple tech stack. So hopefully yours is simple, but let me explain a little bit what some of these examples might be. So whatever tools you have, what CRM you're using, what data provider you're using, what dialer you're using, recording software, those are all mandatory. Sales execution, a lot of times that's built into the CRM. HubSpot, you can send emails and do all of that uh, built in. So these things are really important to have and you want to make sure it's clear what each one's used for and how they're going to be using it, what their workflow looks like. Then we have um, intent, routing, scheduling. These are different tools that you may or may not have. And if you have any questions around sales tech, I'm happy to go deep with you. But like I said, I try to keep um, the sales stack to tech stack as simple as possible because I find the more tools we add, even though they all advertise they're going to increase ROI and make our team more productive, it actually complicates the workflow and it hurts the team's performance. Okay, so tools to support you, onboarding guide, and resource hub. 
what, what's the guide? Where's the checklist? Put it in the playbook for the SDR onboarding, AE onboarding, their guide, their checklist. If you have a resource hub of the different assets, marketing assets that salespeople might be sending out to prospects, that should be in here too. Now, the next part here, which I think is the most important, everyone has a different opinion, but I definitely, definitely find this one to be the most important, is our performance culture. What are we holding you accountable to? And early on, this is where uh, a lot of organizations mess up. Early on, they don't do a great job holding the sales rep or reps accountable to performance metrics because it's still early and they're trying to figure out the process themselves. You can treat a sales rep as a collaborator in your sales process, in the development of your sales process, while also holding them accountable to performance metrics. Those two things are possible. But often we treat them so much like a collaborator and they don't have as much experience within the organization because you just hired them to be able to really do that well. They've never built it from scratch before in the vast majority of cases. Now, first thing are, what are your main KPIs? So whatever your KPIs you're holding them accountable to, those should go in here, metric one, two, three, whatever those should look like. Then put an example of your tracking sheet linked to the main tracking sheet that you're using right in the sales playbook. Even if your CRM is automatically collecting the data, I expect any SDR or AE that's doing prospecting, so I expect this for prospecting data, I expect them to be filling out a sheet at the end of every day of how many calls they made, how many emails they sent, replies, connects, meetings booked. It takes them less than five minutes because it should be in the report in their CRM. But because I make it manual, it forces that rep to look at their numbers, type in their numbers, holds them accountable. Oh shoot, I didn't make as many calls today as I should have. I need to make sure I, I double down tomorrow. Or gosh, my data connect rate plummeted. I need to take a look at my list and make sure I'm not calling that same list tomorrow. This is going to be rough. I want them owning the data just as much as we are. Because if you follow me and you know my content, you know the data sets you free. By having the data, you're not pointing at the sales rep saying, you suck. You're pointing at the sales rep and you're saying, which metric do you want to focus on this week? And we're just improving those metrics. It's a data game. Right. Then the next thing is quota. I like building quota cal calculators where a rep can type in what numbers they would hit and how much money they would make if they hit those numbers. So uh, we have a quota calculator here. Um, if you if you want, we will um, uh, do some more content on uh, on quotas. I think it's worth diving deep into quotas. So if that's interesting to you, let me know. The next here is our performance culture, performance management overview. So here are the foundational pillars. There's an initial setup, a 30, 60, 90 day plan that I'll expect a rep to do. Quarterly check-ins, we're getting feedback during the quarterly check-ins typically. Quarterly close lost review. So looking at all of the deals that are closed lost and seeing, hey, which ones of these could we reactivate or you know, are they closed loss for the right reasons? Maybe we're struggling in a certain area. The closed loss reason will help tell us that. PIPs, I say optional, but I think everybody should have PIPs. Uh, but if you have a PIP, for sure, put it in here. Um, the PIPs are important because it makes it very clear what a rep needs to do in order to not have their job at risk. Now, some people aren't a huge fan of PIPs because they feel like once you put a rep on a PIP, it's really you just trying to force them out. That's not how I encourage doing performance improvement plans. What I encourage doing is you will talk to the rep and say, hey, here's where your performance is struggling. You have the next 30 days, 60 days, whatever your timeline is to fix this metric. And here's what fixed looks like. And if you are able to get to this place over the next month, two months, whatever yours is, then you're no longer on a PIP. It's not great putting people on PIPs, but you know what is even worse? Someone not performing, getting fired out of the blue, <laughs> way worse. So let's not do that. Let's be very clear with people what their performance needs to be in order to keep their job, okay? Sales is performance-based, that's it. We all understand that if we're in this career. Okay, and then next thing here is the biannual review. So twice a year, we're reviewing the performance and then culture setting guide and rep superpowers if that's something that you have built out. I like um, showing the reps who is good at what metrics so they can learn from those people. So like, let's say Sarah's incredible at getting a deal from deal stage one to deal stage two. She's somebody to talk to you about improving in that area. So I like to make, make that very clear. And then you have a conclusion. <laughs> in this case, it's just ours because it's a template, but you say, thank you, whatever it is. 
This is what a sales playbook should look like. It's very, very simple. But what I find is that a lot of organizations don't put as much detail as they should, or they let it get very outdated. And then they scramble when the rep is starting and that rep is not set up on the right foot. Here's the thing. Very rarely will a rep complain about their onboarding. It's very rare. But when things become challenging later, they'll point to their onboarding as an early red flag that they ignored. So even though they didn't complain about the onboarding, it ends up being evidence they used to justify leaving the company, not trying all of that hard because they're going to get fired anyway. It gives them an easy way to point and say it's the company's fault. And here's the thing. They're not wrong. If we aren't properly onboarding our sales reps, we are doing those reps a disservice as leaders. So make sure you put attention and focus here. Now we're going to move into Q&A. We recently hired a sales leader. However, she doesn't have experience with all the products or services. However, I feel she's a great team leader, but we don't have a sales process. How can I encourage her to build one? Well, her compensation should be tied to the performance of the sales team. Having a sales process improves the performance of the sales team. And you need to be holding her accountable to certain metrics. So you have somebody running the, um, the sales team, great. What are we holding them accountable to? And then once we have that clearly outlined and they know what needs to happen in order for us to uh, hit the numbers, you break down the sales process into the component, the different components, and you have them build out the process of what it looks like for that component for when you onboard new reps, which is also part of their responsibility. So what does that look like? Let's say a part of the responsibilities is somebody's cold calling. What's our process for cold calling? Where are the leads coming from? What's the scripts that we use? And you want your sales leader to build out the process for that. What's the flow look like? Where are the different scripts? And have it all in one place so that next time you hire somebody, it works out. And they should be delivering these to you. You should have a cadence. The next is how do we manage the demo or the first sales call? What's the script? What does it look like? What are the next steps? How do we ask for the next steps? And you haven't built that out. And then you just go piece by piece until the whole sales process is built out. Okay. How do we kickstart this zero to one? Uh, just sit down and do it. The template uh, has all uh, the template that I'm giving you is filled with a bunch of other templates to actually build all of these things out. Um, but if you're like, when you say zero, Matt, if you're really saying like, we don't have like a sales process at all, or maybe you have a sales rep, you, you don't know when you're going to hire your next one. Uh, what I do is I start with what area of your sales process is doing the best right now. And then you systematize that area. And then you find that part of the sales process that's not going well, and you measure everything involved in that. So let's say our cold emails suck. What's our open rate? What's our reply rates? What are our booking rates? And you look at that and you go, okay, where, where should we focus to try to improve the results here? So do we need to increase reply rate? Do we need to increase the open rate? And you start building it. Once you get that to a good place, then you document it all. <clears throat> okay. What is the difference between a sales playbook and sales training materials? Um, usually like sales training materials are things that you are going to use in a sales training. So it might be like a script would be in the sales playbook. And that's also can be a training material. Objection guides would probably be there too. But like training materials might be sales calls that you're going to listen to. I'd put those in the sales playbook too. I don't know. I think uh, sales training materials are materials you're using in training and should probably be in the sales playbook too. Unless there's a reason why you wouldn't put it. Like maybe there's uh, like an activity that you have them do that you're not going to put in the sales playbook. But there's training material around that activity. We have subject matter people in our team. They are professional services people, very relationship-based, follow-up, chat, coffee, not process-led. How can I go from nothing to something? So this is Matt again. Um, you pick an area that they have a process around, and you start to systematize that process. Here, first of all, I will say this. If your sales reps are doing well, then you just document their process for the next person to follow. That's sort of the idea. That's what you're trying to do here. If your sales um, people are not doing well, they have no choice. We have to document the process so we can start measuring it and then figure out how to make it better. So that's the back. The question back to you, Matt, is are, is the team doing well? Because if they're not, guess what? Welcome to my world. That's what I tell people when I run a sales team. Do you, you hit, you're hitting your number. Do whatever you want. Do whatever magic, spooky, special stuff that you can do. But... 
if you're not performing, now you got to do it my way. And my way usually is less exciting for our sales reps because I'm making them cold call a bunch and we're doing full court press because we have to hit our numbers. If not, we don't have a job. Okay, Adam, if you have a very complex portfolio, do you create multiple playbooks thinking up to four? Um, if so, only in the scenario where there's four maybe different advanced product lines, you hire salespeople just for those product lines and the processes are very different for those. In each of those sales playbooks, you should give overviews of the other ones just so the rep has that context and also learn, you know, as they go through onboarding and meet with people. But I want to have like an overview there so they understand how the business works at a higher level. Um, so that's what I'll say to that. Uh, you can have multiple, but it really needs to be justified. If you want one sales rep to sell multiple different products and it is complicated, then it all should be in a sales playbook. You're going to have a large one. How do you determine, this is from Ryan, how do you determine sales territories for reps, industries, SMB, mid-market or enterprise, et cetera, when you're starting to add more reps? Great question. Very deep question too. See, this is why I like the q and I can't do a live class on that on that topic because not every company should have territories, frankly. So this is a great example of why I like the Q&A. Um, okay, so, so Ryan, a couple of things here. So first, let's talk about the industry and then the um, kind of different uh, segments of each market. Uh, let's talk about that first, and then we'll talk about territories on the back end of this. So like, let's do SMB mid-market enterprise. Generally, it's challenging for enterprise mid-markets to go down to SMB. SMB is like transactional, very fast-paced, very different sales process. So what I generally tell people to do, wherever they're finding that they're having success with their early sales team, we typically want to increase scale there. With the exception, if there's a lot of volume on the SMB side and having a person there, you do the math and figure out with basic, num you know, with um, basic assumptions, um, that there's a big untapped opportunity, then as an initiative, we may build out a sales team around SMB. But generally, I'm trying to scale in kind of the appropriate segments based on the success that we've had. There's exceptions to that rule. Again, this is very nuanced. We would have to have a back and forth conversation to give you a more clear answer than that. But that's how I think about it, at least very initially. Industry-wise, you do something similar. Where do we have the most traction? And we typically double down in a specific industry. And then we move to an adjacent industry after that. If you're selling everywhere to all people, you break it down, you look where's the highest quantity. And I generally like targeting sales to one of them and then letting the other one still go to the sales or sales reps are still going to manage it. But we focus on systematizing one primary vertical, but instead of trying to systematize all verticals at once. But it's totally okay just to not have a vertical split at all and just let all leads come in all the time. But at a certain point, you will need to do the split because you're going to see the, the um, both those things happen where you're going to have SMB mid-market enterprise in vertical one, two, and then three. And now you add a lot of complexity to the organization and the sales org. It's really complicated when that happens. Feel free to throw in follow-up questions and we'll jump back into it. But the last thing I'll say here is about territories. The real answer is it depends. Obviously, if we're doing a lot of field work, so we need to go meet up with customers, territories are very important because you'll hire in those regions. Um, territories can be challenging because there's you're giving different markets, different people, and they have different volumes. So generally, it impacts the quotas you're giving to them. So someone in a smaller market might have a smaller quota, et cetera. Um, I generally find territories being more effective when there's some in-person or it's in tighter knit industries where that where geography really matters. Territories usually I would not implement until way later on, and we we would use that for either much larger deals or ones that are more geographically minded, like um, construction. Construction is a great example of where you'd have the, the, it tends to be bigger deal sizes, but sometimes it's a software company with with like. $8,000 a year products, $15,000 a year products, it's still helpful to be in the geographic region because you might actually stop by. Um, so anyway, happy to go deeper into that, but territories are a really complicated discussion and usually only makes sense either if you're doing in-person stuff or you get to a size or you really need to think about how leads are getting distributed and your normal round robin is just not appropriate. And also if time zone really matters too, that would be another one. Okay, if you're starting out and you don't have multiple case studies or testimonials, about three to four of each currently. What are some tactics to make those more impactful for our newly hired sales reps? We are competing as agencies that have hundreds. Well, there are a couple of things here. 
it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, it does. The more you have the way, it's way better. Obviously it's way better, but having them is really what matters early on. So keep trying to get as many as you can to make them most impactful. These are resources you're giving to um, organizations who are trying to make a buying decision and it's going to help aid the buying decision. But if you're competing with somebody with hundreds and hundreds, it might make it more complicated. But what I find is you're not often competing with those folks, depending on how you're getting leads. So my response back to you, Zach, would be, are you in, in a random sales cycle? Like if I just grab a random sales process or a sales, a random deal, are you, are you selling against two to three other competitors that all have way more testimonials than you? If so, then yeah, get more testimonials, but we have to be able to articulate our value against those people. That would, I would say would be more important. So keep focusing on getting more testimonials, build out battle cards, and we have templates for these too, but build out battle cards for each of your competitors and show where you are differentiated. Um, I find it being, I find it really impactful having a whole bunch of testimonials, but I will say, I think it's more impactful earlier on. And if these are longer sales processes, it tends to fizzle because they're not like going back to the website and seeing the hundreds again. It's kind of like what gave them the initial juice to book a meeting in the first place. Anyway, just my experience. Um, would you recommend this process for a non-SaaS company? Yes, one to two sales reps, 100%. Uh, there's really not that big of a difference between SaaS sales and uh, service sales, by the way. Very, very similar. And in fact, and since Anthony sort of plus one that question, I'll go a little bit deeper here. Um, there's a lot service companies can learn from SaaS companies because SaaS has done an excellent job really systematizing the sales process and it's specifically B2B. B2C is a whole nother world that I don't talk about. I'm just not, this is not my area. I'm a B2B guy. Um, in B2B, it, it typically you see in the services side, way less structure to their sales process, yet they sell much more expensive products. You know, their margins might not be as good, but the products are much more expensive. Okay, next question here. How can emerging emerging technologies like AI and machine learning be integrated into our sales strategy to boost revenue? And what sales automation tools can help streamline our sales process and increase efficiency? You're not going to love my answer, but I'm going to give it to you. Um, I don't really care right now. What I find is most organizations have a shitty sales process already. And then they try to do stuff like this, like, oh, we just implemented this weird AI thing that'll scrape the internet and like create a custom first line for our emails. It's, it's like, okay, dude. You, you don't, you're not closing any fucking deals. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> Great. What's going on? And the most powerful thing you can do is speak to your buyers. And I, this is the hill I will die on. There is nothing more powerful than speaking to your buyers. So speak to them and then do some of this stuff to optimize. I don't care how AIs and machine learning can be integrated into the sales strategy to boost revenue. I don't care. Because most organizations I talk to are not even close to where that would be all that impactful. And anyone here who's tries it, who's tried it before knows it is pretty difficult to get like your messaging and everything just working right. So I don't know, man. Um, I like it. It's cool. I'm pretty deep. I create a lot of custom GPTs. I love utilizing AI, but <clears throat> in terms of how, like what's the right way to integrate into the sales process, I'm not sure. What I would encourage you to do is build something out that's working and then see what you can use that to make what's working better. And that would probably be the place I would start. Um, I'm a hiring manager trying to turn our process from a really handheld approach to a more independent one and encouraging their independence. How should I approach this? Um, I'm assuming you mean like you handhold the sales reps a lot. And you're trying to say like, hey, get off to the races. You don't need as much handholding. If that's what you mean, if you, if you mean like the sales process is very handholding and you want it more independent, then correct me. But um, if you're trying to like get reps out there, I have one very, very, very simple suggestion for you. Just make them start doing the job. I talked to a larger company, um, it's probably three months ago, and they were talking about ramp time for their SDRs. And they were saying our SDRs, they take a really long time to ramp. It was like, six months, something crazy. And I said, well, when do you uh, get them cold calling? And they were like, they cold call a month two. What? So you're saying they're there for four weeks, five weeks even, and then they start calling? They're like, yeah. I'm like, new plan. They should call day three. They should be on the phones day four. Worst case, they should be on the phones week two. I want them doing the job. So how do you make this transition? I don't think 
you need to reduce the hand holding all that much, unless it's crazy and you, you can be the judge of that. What I think you need to do is get them doing the stuff on their own more. It's more additive than it is subtractive. So you know, do your trainings, do call listenings, do where they tap into other people and listen to their sales calls, all of that. But then make sure they're spending a lot of time trying to book their own demos, doing their own demos. So a lot of times I see companies will have demo certifications uh, and they'll make those certifications really long. Make it short for a baseline, get them booking their own appointments and let them do demos with the appointments they book for themselves. There's no downside of that. And let them use certifications and close rates or something to earn SDR support maybe. Depends on how you guys are structured. So that's what I'll say there. Hopefully that was helpful. If an SDR slash AE that has a good base knowledge of sales and methodology joins a company in a totally new field, cybersecurity in my case, should they work on specific industry knowledge first or get to doing outbound ASAP and learn from, from osmosis? osmosis. You do both. Um, first of all, I would really try to hire sales, right? If you want to maximize their, their chances of success, hire sales reps with experience. If you know you have some salespeople, I think it's totally fine um, hiring people without experience because you feel like they have a lot of the other qualities that somebody would needs in order to be successful. Totally fine. But if there's like an early sales process or a couple of salespeople, you're really trying to build something good, uh, then hire people with experience. It's going to shortcut a lot for you. That being said, you do both. Um, you get them deep in the world of the industry and you have them cold calling at the same time because you're going to learn how to speak that language much much quicker. Uh, I don't know if you've come to these before, but if you have, you know, I talk often about how I want a sales rep to be able to go to an industry event, speak with a bunch of people, like a meetup group with 20 people there, like really intimate groups, go and be able to talk to people, network, have conversations, and no one realizes they're a salesperson. And instead they think that they're also in the industry. That's what I'm looking for. I have joined in an early stage SaaS startup. We don't have any customers and are in the process to start our outbound. What would you suggest to me as I'm the only person on the team responsible for creating this and implementing these strategies? Very simple. Um, make a list. Check that list, just like Santa does. He checks it twice. Do the same thing. Make sure as many qualified or seemingly qualified folks are on that list as possible. List of companies, list of contacts. Main primary decision that you're trying to do. Make that list. Call the shit out of that list. Track every call you make, everybody who answers the phone. So I make 100 calls, 20 people answer the phone. How many meetings do you book? Write down every meeting that you book. Do that for your first month. With that data, you'll be able to look at it and you'll determine where you're struggling. Oh, I need to fix this area, this area, this area. And then that's where you go from there. Very, very simple. Um, 16 steps to repeatable sales on Amazon. By that, that covers um, a little bit more in detail than what I just did. Uh, these live classes, I cover some of this stuff too. Um, and then uh, Cold to Committed, which is my first book, has a lot of the material too. Our YouTube channel has a lot of scripts and stuff like that. How long should it take for SDRs to start booking meetings on a daily basis? I mean, starting to book meetings, like quick, maybe the second month at the latest. Um, but to, like get them really ramped up, two to three months. I expect them to hit their full number in month three. Uh, there's exceptions to that. You know, there's exceptions to everything. But for the most part, that's what I expect. To do um, last questions before you go. Ooh, slipping it in. Uh, how would you encourage the newly hired sales leader to win the team's confidence in her and ensure a smooth transition? Simple. Show them the data and say what metrics do you guys think we should improve, and then go and improve that metric. So uh, I actually learned uh, what I'm about to tell you now from a friend of mine who's pretty high up in a uh, food distribution company, and his his reputation he'll move anywhere, and his reputation is he'll turn around your distribution center. You guys are struggling in your distribution center. This guy fixes it and he fixes it quick. So I asked him how he does it. He goes in, he asks all the people working there, the lowest level of employees, what do you think needs to be fixed here? What's the problem? Writes down all the feedback he gets, puts it on a whiteboard with the executive team, organizes how to fix it, goes to the team and says, this is what I heard from all of, all of you. Here are the things that we're going to be do, do, do to fix it. Is everybody on board with making these changes? Are we missing anything? Okay, great. Let's do it. And then actually fix it. You'll gain trust really quick really quick. And data helps you do that, by the way. Get your hands dirty. Exactly. Um, what if they're not welcoming? <sighs> the hell? Like what a sales rep is not welcoming of support to make more money? Not good. Uh, I'm joining a small but fluent software service company. So far, the CEO has brought in all the business through referrals. What do you suggest? Where are the referrals coming from? And seeing if we can expand the referrals a little bit. And um, if not, what are some other channels that have worked before in the past and start to work through those channels? If you literally have nothing, it's like the referrals are just totally random from existing customers and you can't do anything to make those better, uh, then I would just start cold calling. 
No, I mean, the team is junior and may not be very supportive in the beginning. Data will crush any arguments. So uh, what you want to do is you want to show the data to your team, how much money they're making, show what it would look like when you make the fixes and how much money they'll be making. They'll be on board pretty quick. Okay, cool. That's it. Have a fantastic day and we'll talk soon. Bye.